Hi, I'm Dave Stotts from Drive Through History. Happy President's Day. President's Day lands on the third Monday in February of each year. It was originally celebrated as George Washington's birthday on February 22nd, but later included Abraham Lincoln's birthday on February 12th. The official shift to the National President's Day began in the late 1960s when the U.S. Congress proposed a measure known as the Uniform Monday Holiday Act. This act included a provision to combine Washington and Lincoln's birthday into one three day weekend. In 1971, the celebrations of Washington and Lincoln were finally rolled into one national holiday on the third Monday of February. While Washington and Lincoln still remain the two most recognized American leaders, President's Day was expanded to recognize the lives and achievements of all of America's chief executives throughout history. From George Washington to Joe Biden, we've had 46 presidents of the United States. At least that's what the official list says. Technically, Grover Cleveland is counted twice because he served in non-consecutive terms as our 22nd and 24th presidents. Although 12 other US presidents serve two terms, they serve them back to back. So they're only counted once on the official list. It makes sense to me. Since this is an educational show, I thought we could run through the names of the presidents together. Easy enough, right? But hey, I don't need to stand here and toot my history horn, so I've recruited my six-year-old buddy James, who also happens to be the grandson of our producer, to lead us in singing our way through the list. Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. Adams, Jackson, Van Buren, Harrison, Tyler, Polk, and Taylor. Fillmore, Pierce, Buchanan, and Lincoln, Johnson, Grant, and Hayes. Garfield, Arthur, Cleveland, Harrison, Cleveland, McKinley. Roosevelt, Taft, Wilson, Harding, Coolidge, Hoover, Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, and Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump. <laughs> so with all due respect to the current administration, that song, delivered impressively from memory, by the way, was recorded prior to the outcome of the most recent election. So don't take it personally. The State of the Union is strong. President's Day in America really goes all the way back to 1800. Following President George Washington's death in 1799, his February 22nd birthday became an annual day of remembrance in the United States. At the time, George Washington was considered the most important figure in American history. Events like the centennial of his birth in 1832 and the start of construction of the Washington Monument in 1848 were cause for national celebrations. So let's travel to Virginia and explore the life and legacy of our first president. If you're gonna drive through the history of one of the most courageous, selfless, heroic statesmen in our nation's founding era, then I figure you could go with something like this, a 1980 H1 Hummer. Comes complete with an interior and an exterior. Got the little whirly burly, got the little circular intake. It's got one of these. I think that's the fluid junction valve, one of my favorite features. One of these cool headlights with the shiny things. Ow, you can do your squats. In case you get hijacked and someone has stolen the vehicle, you're trying to get back in it. You got your handles here to crawl back in and punch it. No trailer hitch is complete without two additional trailer hitches. Oh man, check out these big old beefy tires. Love these things. Oh, Benedict Arnold. 
Let's go declare a little independence with this bad boy. George Washington was born in the English colony of Virginia on February 22, 1732. He lived on a tobacco plantation with his father, mother, and five siblings. The George Washington Birthplace National Monument in Westmoreland County, Virginia was built in 1896 to honor the location. George Washington's father died when he was only 11 years old. so. George spent a lot of time with his half-brother Lawrence at his Mount Vernon estate overlooking the Potomac River. It was here that George learned the ins and outs of farming, ranching, and cultured society. In 1751, Lawrence Washington got tuberculosis. In hopes that a change of climate would help him recover, he traveled to the island of Barbados, Lawrence brought along his then 17-year-old half-brother, George. In Barbados, George Washington got a case of smallpox. He recovered and therefore had immunity. It turns out this would prove providential since George stayed healthy during the Revolutionary War, where it's estimated that more soldiers were lost to smallpox than battle. Lawrence died in 1752 and his Mount Vernon estate was later inherited by George Washington, making him one of the youngest and largest landowners in Virginia. Today, Mount Vernon is beautifully preserved with a mansion, gardens, and a working farm. It's also the burial location for George, his wife Martha, and 20 other Washington family members. In 1753, George Washington began what would become a long and illustrious military career. He started as a British colonel in the French and Indian War, where in 1755, he miraculously survived the Battle of Monongahela. George Washington later wrote, By the all-powerful dispensations of providence, I have been protected beyond all human probability or expectation for I had four bullets through my coats and two horses shot under me, yet escaped unhurt, although death was leveling my companions on every side of me. Four years later, George Washington married Martha Dandridge Custis, a 26-year-old widow and mother of two children. They continued a life of juggling farming here at Mount Vernon and George being called off to serve in the military. In 1775, after the Battle of Bunker Hill, George Washington was commissioned as the top general of the Continental Army. He wrote to Martha, My dearest, it has been determined in Congress that the whole army raised for the defense of the American cause shall be put under my care and that it is necessary for me to proceed immediately to Boston to take up command of it. You may believe me when I assure you in the most solemn manner that so far from seeking this appointment, I have used every endeavor in my power to avoid it. But as it has been a kind of destiny that has thrown me upon this service, I shall hope that my undertaking it is designed to answer some good purpose. I shall rely, therefore, confidently on that providence which has heretofore preserved and been bountiful to me, not doubting but that I shall return safely to you in the fall." One year later, on July 2nd, 1776, General Washington issued general orders to his troops. The time is now near at hand, which must probably determine whether Americans are to be free men or slaves, whether they are to have any property they can call their own, 
whether their houses and farms are to be pillaged and destroyed and themselves consigned to a state of wretchedness from which no human efforts will deliver them. The fate of unborn millions will now depend under God on the courage and conduct of this army. Our cruel and unrelenting enemy leaves us no choice but a brave resistance or the most abject submission. We have therefore to resolve to conquer or die. This is Valley Forge National Historical Park, where General George Washington and the Continental Army camped during the winter of 1777 to 1778. Few places in America honor the spirit of patriotism, sacrifice, faith, and resolve more than Valley Forge. This is the United States National Memorial Arch. It commemorates the arrival of General Washington and the Continental Army into Valley Forge. It was designed to be a simplified version of the Arch of Titus in Rome, which marked the capture of Jerusalem by Emperor Titus in 70 AD. In the classical tradition, this memorial arch is an honorable tribute to General Washington and the courageous army he led. It was here on December 19, 1777, that 12,000 soldiers and 400 women and children marched into Valley Forge and began to build what was essentially the fourth largest city in the United States at the time. They ended with 1,500 log huts and two miles of fortified barriers. Valley Forge was a naturally defensible plateau where the Continental Army trained, recovered, and resupplied, while winter weather and impassable roads stopped the war with the British. Over six long months here at Valley Forge, the Continental Army under Washington's leadership emerged as a united and disciplined fighting force. However, there was a huge cost. Hunger, disease, and lack of supplies wreaked havoc. While there was never a battle at Valley Forge, nearly 2,000 people died here in just one winter. Valley Forge received its name from the Iron Forge built in the 1740s along nearby Valley Creek. However, Valley Forge took on a dual meaning after the six-month ordeal of suffering and sacrifice helped forge the first American army. This place reshaped a collection of ragtag soldiers from all walks of life into a unified fighting force capable of defeating the British and winning American independence during the remaining five years of the war. Regarding Valley Forge, Thomas Paine said, let it be told to the future world that in the depth of winter, when nothing but hope and virtue could survive, that the city and the country, alarmed at one common danger, came forth to meet and to repulse it. This is Washington's headquarters, also known as the Isaac Potts House. Now, it housed General Washington and some of his military commanders during the 1777 to 1778 Valley Forge encampment. And near the headquarters is this awesome statue, George Washington. After surviving the terrible winter here at Valley Forge and witnessing his collection of untrained patriots turn into a faithful, disciplined fighting force, George Washington wrote, to the distinguished character of patriots, it should be our highest glory 
to laud the more distinguished character of Christian. For me, Valley Forge celebrates the ability of regular citizens to pull together by faith and overcome adversity during extraordinary times. An incredible reminder for Americans today as we forge ahead during our own extraordinary times. After the long winter at Valley Forge, George Washington went on to lead a professional army and defeat the British. On September 3, 1783, the Treaty of Paris was signed between Great Britain and the United States, making peace between the two nations and formally ending the American Revolution. A new nation was born. This is the Washington Memorial Chapel. It was built in 1903 as a tribute to George Washington and his courageous service to our country. It currently serves as a chapel for visitors to Valley Forge and the home for the Episcopal Parish in the region. That bell tower houses the Justice Bell, a replica of the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. Now, the Justice Bell traveled the country between 1915 and 1920 as part of the historic campaign to gain voting rights for women in America. Speaking of the Liberty Bell and historic campaigns, it's time to hit the road again and visit the city of Philadelphia for the next chapter in George Washington's life. But for this road trip, I'm gonna trade in my Revolutionary War garb for something a bit more uh, founding father-like. This is Philadelphia, the largest city in Pennsylvania. It was founded by William Penn in 1682 and went on to be instrumental during the American Revolution as a meeting place for the founding fathers. This is where they signed the Declaration of Independence in 1776 and the Constitution in 1787. Philadelphia is rich with history, including Independence Hall, the Liberty Bell, and of course, the iconic Rocky Steps here at the Philadelphia Museum of Arts, where the Italian stallion, Rocky Balboa, completed his triumphant morning run. I mean, how hard could it be? I mean, it's just steps, right? I mean, what did he have that I don't have? like a stunt man in here. Hey, how's it going? All right. And what visit to Philadelphia is complete without this? What's this town known for? Cheesesteaks. So I'll take Philly style cheesesteak, just your standard cheesesteak. And uh, yeah, I guess to go. To go, yeah. When the Articles of Confederation proved inadequate for the new nation, George Washington agreed to preside over the Constitutional Convention here in Philadelphia in 1787. After a bunch of hard work, the United States had a constitution. In 1789, George Washington was unanimously elected as the first president of the United States. From 1790 to 1800, the city of Philadelphia was the capital of our new nation. This was the location of George Washington's house, where he led the executive branch, met with members of Congress, and entertained foreign dignitaries. Now, government business happened down there, a block away at the Pennsylvania State House, now known as Independence Hall. As it turns out, George Washington was the only U.S. president that never actually lived in Washington, D.C. The president's house was destroyed in 1832. 
This memorial structure was built over its archaeological ruins in 2010 as part of an effort to honor national freedom and racial equality. Now, as you can see over here, the original foundations are still visible. In July of 1790, the U.S. Congress passed the Residence Act, which called for the permanent capital of the United States to be located along the Potomac River. George Washington personally oversaw the construction of the 10-square-mile federal district, which later became known as Washington, D.C. Washington was closely involved in the project, including the building of the Capitol and the new president's mansion, now known as the White House. George Washington was elected as president of the United States twice. Both times, the vote was unanimous. During his two terms, Washington played an essential role in shaping the office of the U.S. presidency, honoring the checks and balances of constitutional leadership and rejecting the hallmarks of British monarchy and authoritarian rule. When he was offered a third term, he rejected it. Although the original Constitution set no limit on how many times a person could be elected as president, George Washington chose not to try for a third term. He wasn't about power, he was about duty. And two terms were enough for him, or for any president. To announce his decision not to seek a third term as president, George Washington delivered his famous farewell address from here in Philadelphia on September 17, 1796. In it, he warned Americans against the baneful effects of political parties, sectionalism within the country, and entanglements with foreign alliances outside the country. The farewell address was published in papers throughout the nation and went on to be a mainstay in libraries, schools, and government offices. Probably the most important of Washington's warnings was this. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness. George Washington knew that the long-term success of the United States rested on the Christian practices and moral virtues of its citizens. If these, quote, indispensable supports were ever removed, the Constitutional Republic would be at risk. On February 19th, 1862, in the midst of the American Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln issued a proclamation calling on America to celebrate Washington's birthday. Lincoln, quote, recommended to the people of the United States that they assemble in their customary places of meeting for public solemnities on the 22nd day of February to celebrate the anniversary of the birth of the father of this country by causing to be read to them his immortal farewell address. Since 1896, the U.S. Senate has commemorated Washington's birthday with an annual reading of his farewell address by a selected senator. At the conclusion of the reading, all 7,641 words, the senator writes his or her thoughts on the continuing significance of Washington's address in a special leather-bound book stored in the federal archives. I would maintain that the ideals and warnings embodied in George Washington's farewell address are more important today than ever in the history of our great nation.
George Washington retired here to Mount Vernon and returned to farming his estate. At the age of 67, he caught a cold working these fields after riding horseback for several hours in the snow. The next morning, it developed into acute laryngitis, and the doctors were called in. Their response was to bleed him heavily four times, a process of cutting one's arm to let the bad blood out. They also had him gargle with a mixture of molasses, vinegar, and butter. Despite their best efforts, the doctors couldn't save him. George Washington died here at his Mount Vernon estate on December 14, 1799. According to tradition, his final words were, Father of mercies, take me unto thyself, tis well. So I made it down here to George and Martha Washington's tomb here at Mount Vernon. And on the wall is engraved, I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. John 11, 25, 26. There it is, the gospel of Jesus Christ, engraved on the tombstone of our country's first president. As our Christian roots continue to disappear from the history books, it's more important than ever to come out to our historical sites and witness these powerful reminders ourselves. Speaking of historical sites, while I was visiting Mount Vernon, the awesome team there gave me unique access to the Washington Library. I was blown away by the remarkable history they safeguard there, such as George Washington's family Bible and his original presidential portrait. Here's a snapshot of that special day in Virginia. Mount Vernon is open to the public every day of the year. The tradition of allowing the public to see the estate is a 200-year-old tradition started by Washington himself, who wrote in 1794, I have no objection to any sober or orderly persons gratifying their curiosity in viewing the buildings and gardens about Mount Vernon. Then there's Washington's Presidential Library, an amazing resource for scholars, students, and anyone interested in George Washington, colonial America, and the revolutionary and founding eras. And besides that, it's one of the most beautiful and peaceful libraries I've ever been in. I've got to admit, the gravitas of the library was impressed upon me pretty deeply as six exquisite busts of the founding fathers loomed large. It was as if the spirits of George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison were all watching from above. Yeah, this is not a library in which you want to stick your chewing gum under the table. But then came the pièce de résistance, an item so special only the library's curator was allowed to handle it. So we're here now in the main reading room of the Washington Library on the grounds of Mount Vernon, and I've been given unique access to an item that I can only believe would be priceless. Uh, this is the Washington Family Bible. Inside the front cover, it says Mary Washington, his mother. So this is the Washington Family Bible. So it looks like we, there were some fragments that were found and they were able to piece them together and fill in the gaps a little bit. That must have taken a lot of work to do. To see Washington's own handwriting in the Bible that he read from and used was something I won't forget. And of course, in the presence of something so historically significant, I always find a way to ask the important questions. What would this Bible be worth? Any you haven't old. had it on a... 
you know, antique road show or no, anything. No, this will not be put up for sale. So the Washington Library was also kind enough to give me access to this special room. This is easily the most recognized, most famous portrait of our nation's first president. This is the portrait of George Washington painted by Rembrandt Peel. And what's unique about this one is that this is the original. Major General Henry Lee delivered a eulogy for our nation's first president. In it, he gave George Washington a title that stuck for over 220 years. First in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. What an incredible record. What an incredible statesman. What an incredible legacy. And if you're going to end the story of George Washington and his legacy somewhere, what better place to do it than Washington, D.C.? Much of our nation's capital echoes with the legacy of George Washington and the constitutional republic that he was instrumental in founding. Buildings, streets, statues, artwork, documents, inscriptions, memorials, and monuments all tell the story of our first president and his special role in establishing our unique country. And when it comes to monuments, George Washington definitely has one of the most visible and iconic ones here in Washington, D.C. As early as 1783, the U.S. Congress decided that a statue honoring George Washington, the great Revolutionary War general, should be placed near the site of the new congressional building, wherever it might be. After Washington became president and it was determined that the new federal capital would be built here in Washington, D.C., architect Pierre Leonfant left a place for Washington's statue at the western end of what would be called the National Mall. Robert Mills had the winning idea on the shape of the monument. Since it was supposed to be unparalleled in the world, Mills looked to the ancient Egyptians who were world famous for their massive monuments. An obelisk is a tapered column that in ancient Egyptian mythology represented the place from which the world was created. It symbolized the sun and the cycle of rebirth. Obelisks were erected to honor pharaohs and their gods, so it was thought to be a fitting choice for the father of our country. Construction began over 50 years later, on the 4th of July in 1848. Representatives of the private Washington National Monument Society laid the cornerstone of the monument, a 24,500 pound block of pure white marble. But funds ran out and construction stopped after six years, as you can see from that line. Over a decade later, around the time of the Civil War, Mark Twain wrote, it is an eyesore to the people. It ought to be either pulled down or built up and finished. Finally, in 1876, on the centennial of American independence, our 18th president, Ulysses S. Grant, authorized construction to be completed. Made of approximately 36,000 blocks of marble and granite, stacked 555 feet in the air, the Washington Monument was the tallest structure in the world at the time of its completion in December of 1884. It remains the tallest structure in Washington, D.C. to this day. And up there, on top, overlooking everything in our nation's capital, is a metal capstone with the Latin engraving that reads, Laus Deo. The translation, praise be to God. The Washington Monument is the famous obelisk watching over our nation's capital. It rises on one end of the reflecting pool in the center of the mall. Now, on the other end of the reflecting pool rests another monument to another great president. 
I figured this was a perfectly good segue to our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. By the way, here's an interesting President's Day nugget for you. Although the date for President's Day floats each year, it never lands on the actual birthday of any American president. George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, William Henry Harrison, and Ronald Reagan were all born in February. But their birthdays all come either too early or too late to overlap with President's Day. So, now you know. Okay, it's off to the American Midwest on the next leg of our President's Day journey. This is Springfield, the capital of Illinois. It was settled in the early 1800s by fur trappers and traders pioneering the West. According to local history, the first cabin was built here in 1820 by John Kelly. The name Springfield was later suggested by Mary, his wife, after Spring Creek, which ran through their property. Springfield's most famous resident was Abraham Lincoln, who lived here between 1837 and 1861, when he left for Washington, D.C. as President of the United States. Hey, Abe, a little taller than I expected. This is the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum in Springfield, which documents the life of our 16th U.S. President and the course of the American Civil War. It combines the traditional scholarship of a presidential library with an awesome interactive museum experience. As presidential libraries go, this one always ranks near the top of the most visited in the United States. Abraham Lincoln was born on February 12, 1809 in a one-room log cabin on Sinking Spring Farm near Hodgenville, Kentucky. About two years later, his family moved to the Knob Creek Farm just a few miles away. Today, the Abraham Lincoln Birthplace National Historical Park covers both sites, his birthplace and boyhood home. Abraham Lincoln's parents were poor, hardworking pioneers trying to make their way in the new territories of the United States. At the age of seven, his family moved to 160 acres on the western frontier of Indiana. There, he had a simple country life of working long days and reading by firelight in the evenings. Lincoln was a self-taught young man. His home education focused on books such as Shakespeare and the Bible. These were the formative years that established honest Abe's values, character, and work ethic. In 1830, Lincoln's family moved to southern Illinois, and Lincoln got a job on a riverboat hauling freights up and down the Mississippi River. Later, he worked as a shopkeeper and a postmaster before he got interested in local politics. In 1834, he was elected to the Illinois State Legislature. Lincoln was a pretty smart guy. He taught himself the law and passed the bar exam in 1836. He then moved here to Springfield a year later to establish himself as a lawyer and start a family. Honest Abe was a nickname that Lincoln came to embrace with pride. He believed his own integrity and he worked hard to maintain his reputation as an honest politician and lawyer, something that's not always easy to find in those fields. Let's go outside for a bit and walk through the city of Springfield to see where Abraham Lincoln laid down his roots. This is the Lincoln family home, where Abe, his wife Mary Todd, and their four boys, Robert, Edward, Willie, and Tad, spent 17 years. This is the only home that Lincoln ever owned. Surrounding Lincoln's home is a four-block historical area that's been preserved 
to look like it did back in the 1860s. It's a snapshot in time, which makes you feel like you're back in Lincoln's old neighborhood. His law offices where he worked and the old state capitol building where he served were just a short walk down the road. Abraham Lincoln joined the brand new Republican Party in 1856 and ran for the United States Senate. The Republican platform was pretty simple. One, build the United States on cities and commerce rather than plantations and agriculture. And two, oppose the spread of slavery to the new American territories. In June of 1856, Lincoln delivered his now famous House Divided speech here in front of the old state Capitol building. In that speech, Lincoln quoted from the Bible to illustrate that the United States, quote, cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. He was referring to the gospels when Jesus said this, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. Every city and household divided against itself will not stand. Matthew 12, 25. Lincoln then squared off against Stephen Douglas, a leading Democrat in Congress in a series of famous debates. Douglas argued that the voters of each territory, rather than the federal government, had the right to decide whether their territory should be slave or free. Lincoln argued against all slavery, calling it a violation of the most basic tenets of the Declaration of Independence. Although Abraham Lincoln lost the Senate election, his well-reasoned position against slavery put him on the national map. Just four years later, the Republican Party chose Lincoln as their candidate for President of the United States. And, as destiny would have it, he won. Abe, honest Abe. So you're gonna give me the straight story on anything I ask, okay. Okay, let's see about that. Area 51, what's there? The Apollo moon landings, real or fake? Is there a bowling alley in the basement of the White House and who put it there? Is that you? It's kind of tacky, not very presidential. The world, flat, round, or donut? Give me your opinion. Who is the best U.S. president? I'm thinking Rutherford B. Hayes. Everybody knows that. You know, half the school kids out there think you were like the second president of the United States. They had no idea you were the sixteenth. Whose decision to put you on a penny? I mean, come on. <laughs> kind of an insult, right? <sighs> the election of an anti-slavery northerner as president of the United States drove many southerners over the brink. By the time Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated in March of 1861, seven southern states had already seceded from the Union and formed the Confederate States of America. Soon, four more states joined the Confederacy. But Lincoln vowed to preserve the Union, even if it meant war. Let's return to the Lincoln Library and Museum in Springfield, Illinois, to continue our story. The American Civil War started on April 12, 1861, when Lincoln sent a fleet of Union ships to supply Fort Sumter, a federal army in South Carolina. The Confederates fired cannons at the Union fleet and the U.S. fort, which was viewed as a declaration of war. Hopes for a quick Union victory were shattered when they were defeated by Confederate troops at the Battle of Bull Run couple of months later. As a result, Lincoln called up half a million Union troops, and both sides prepared for a long, brutal war. The Confederate leader was Jefferson Davis, a seasoned military hero and former Secretary of War. 
Lincoln had little military experience, but surprised many when he proved to be an inspirational leader and battlefield strategist. In the fall of 1862, Abraham Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation, which changed the legal status under federal law of more than 3.5 million African Americans in the Confederate States from slave to free. That meant that as soon as a slave escaped the control of the Confederacy, either by running north across Union lines or through the southern advance of Union troops, that person was permanently free. Lincoln also supported the passage of a constitutional amendment outlawing slavery altogether, which was passed as the 13th Amendment, just after Lincoln's death in 1865. As such, preserving the United States and ending slavery would be Abraham Lincoln's greatest legacy. But we're jumping ahead a bit. Let's return to the history of the American Civil War and make a quick jaunt to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Washington, D.C. was in a panic. 72,000 Confederate troops were just 60 miles away near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Mounting casualties of the war were causing Lincoln's popularity to fall. So if the Confederate general Robert E. Lee could get a quick victory here at Gettysburg, he might be able to pressure Lincoln into a truce. But this Confederate window of opportunity was fast closing as Union General Ulysses S. Grant was about to capture Vicksburg on the Mississippi River which would divide the Confederacy and free up thousands of Union troops to fight Lee here in the East. This is Gettysburg National Military Park, where the Battle of Gettysburg began on July 1st, 1863. After two days of intense fighting with ammunition running low, Lee ordered a direct Confederate attack. But one of his generals disobeyed the order and delayed the advance. As a result, over 12,000 Confederate soldiers marched across a mile of open field without artillery cover directly into the Union defenses at Cemetery Ridge. It was known as Pickett's Charge. In the end, the Confederates were pushed back and the Union Army won the crucial Battle of Gettysburg. Horribly, there were over 50,000 American casualties in just three days. It was a turning point in the Civil War. The next day, Vicksburg surrendered to General Grant, giving the Union Army control of the Mississippi River. The Confederacy was on the run. Twelve days after the Battle of Gettysburg, Abraham Lincoln proclaimed a day of prayer to, quote, recognize and confess the presence of the Almighty Father and the power of His hand equally in these triumphs and in these sorrows. Four months later, on November 19th, 1863, Lincoln returned to these hallowed battlefields and delivered his now famous Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. 
But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. In 1864, Abraham Lincoln was re-elected president. At his second inaugural address in March of 1865, Lincoln stressed the need to reconstruct the South and rebuild the Union, with malice toward none, with charity for all. Shortly thereafter, on April 9th, Confederate General Lee surrendered to Union General Grant at the Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia, effectively ending the war. It had lasted more than four brutal years at the cost of over 600,000 American lives. Two days later, Lincoln gave a speech on the White House lawn, again stressing the need for reconciliation and reconstruction in the southern states. Sadly, less than one week later, Abraham Lincoln was shot by actor and Confederate activist John Wilkes Booth during an evening performance at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. Lincoln never regained consciousness and died the next morning, April 15th, 1865. Let's return once more to Springfield, Illinois to complete our story. Lincoln's assassination made him a national hero. On April 21st, 1865, a train carrying his coffin left Washington, D.C. for the journey back here to his hometown of Springfield. Along the way, Lincoln's funeral train passed through 180 cities and seven states so that thousands upon thousands of Americans could pay respect to their fallen president. Lincoln arrived here at the Oak Ridge Cemetery and was laid to rest in this mausoleum on May 4th, 1865. He was later moved to his formal tomb and memorial up there. Today, this section of the cemetery is known as the Lincoln Tomb and State Historical Site. Abraham Lincoln proved to be one of the greatest presidents in American history. His Emancipation Proclamation paved the way for slavery's abolition, while his Gettysburg Address stands as one of the most meaningful speeches in American history. In the end, his assassination made him a martyr, an enduring symbol for the causes of liberty, equality, and the preservation of our great republic. The lives and legacies of Washington and Lincoln are truly special chapters in American history. In short, without our first president, George Washington, we wouldn't have a constitutional republic. And without our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, our republic would have ceased to exist. 
powerful truths to reflect upon this President's Day in America.